So uh, right now we're going to hear uh, we're going to hear from a gastroenterologist, and uh, this is an important uh, specialty that we need to we need to get some more focus on because the GI guys can can definitely uh, diagnose this. Uh, much more often uh, than other specialties. So, without further ado, if we can, let's uh, let's get back into our seats and please welcome Dr. Matthew Eaves from Mobile, Alabama. Morning. Uh, well, for starters, I guess you could first ask what exactly is a gastroenterologist. The, my presentation is mostly for patients, as this is really a patient conference. Now, if I'm out in, I'm really from Fairhope, Alabama, which is a little town on the uh, Mobile Bay. It's a pretty place. But if I'm out in town and somebody says, oh, you're a doctor, what kind of doctor are you? I say, I'm a gastroenterologist. And there are some people that are, you know, not that familiar with that in Alabama. And I'll say, well, I'm the guy that does your colonoscopy. And their next comment is, hey, did you see the game Saturday? You know. <laughs> but what is really going to drive this is, as was just alluded to, we're probably the ones who are going to diagnose your neuroendocrine tumor. Um, and so that, there's a lot that goes along with that. But that, we're going to do one other very important thing, and that is refer you to the other people who are going to treat you. And so I thought that it would be helpful to you all for me to talk a little bit about what goes into that decision as to where you get referred to and what you should be looking for in your interactions with your physicians. This is a, uh, there's a little bit of a story behind this picture. I took my wife to New York one Christmas and I could not walk into another sh woman's clothing store so I snuck off into the Met and I looked at this picture. This is Aristotle looking at a bust of Homer. Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great. Now, if you can imagine how the greatest conqueror the world has ever known, I can't imagine that he had much patience for his teacher telling him he was making mistakes. And there must have been a tremendous amount of political pressure on Aristotle to do what made Alexander the Great happy. But here he's looking at Homer trying to decide, am I really doing the right thing? And that applies to a lot of things. My first three or four slides kind of all run together. But essentially, you're going to see one of the secrets, at least I, I should also tell you that I'm in private practice. I'm a um, professor at the University of South Alabama as well, but I'm really... 99% of what I do is nuts and bolts gastroenterology in my clinic and in my hospital. Um, well, the truth is, there's more work to do than I have time to do. And that's true probably of 95% of the other doctors. So you're constantly trying to decide what's important, what's not important, what can wait, what cannot wait. And that decision has tremendous impact on you, especially somebody who has a neuroendocrine tumor, because it's not simple and it takes a lot of time. So I guess that would be the first question I would ask you if you're, and you're thinking about your relationship with your doctor. Does he really take the time to know what's happening to me and to know what the issue is with my disease? You know, when we talk about neuroendocrine tumors, that is not a simple topic, okay? There's at least a dozen different types. I think you probably could put a bunch of doctors together and have a hard time agreeing on what the complete list of neuroendocrine tumors are. 
In addition to that, each tumor, you know, they talk about the grade of a tumor. Now you can talk really great tumors two ways. You can say, how fast does it grow or how immature it is. When you're first conceived, that cell is very immature. It can become any cell in your body. Okay, so that would be referred to as poorly differentiated. If I were to cut off a little piece of my finger, you'd see a, a cell that would become a skin cell or an epidural cell. You'd see vascular epithelium. You'd see a neurons. You'd see white blood cells, red blood cells. All of those cells are very mature, and they're designed to do one function real well. That's the grade of a tumor, how mature, how immature that cell is. Then the other way you'd stage a tumor, or how far, you talk about how far it spread, or metastasized. Well, generally speaking, tumors that are real immature respond better to chemotherapy, but spread faster. Tumors that are real mature or well differentiated spread slower, but are harder to treat. That's one of the reasons why historically carcinoid has been so difficult to treat because it grows exceptionally slow. Now when I think about my practice, and it's funny, this slide is coming from a, a, a presentation I'm using to interview nurse practitioners who are kind of helping me get some of, some of the things off the ground in my practice. And I put it in here because it really describes physicians, okay? If you want to look at the first level, essentially that means can you get patients in and out the door without hurting the patient, not cause a catastrophic problem? You know, I used to be a flight deck officer on an aircraft carrier. And we would scream at each other all day long. And my first week there, I was walking back to my uh, stateroom kind of depressed, and the air boss stops me and goes, what's wrong? I said, it's a long day. He said, well, did anybody die? He said, no. He said, did we break any airplanes? I said, no. He said, then it was a great day, okay? Essentially, that's the level that you're talking about there, and probably 95% of the physicians or so in America are at that level, are able to do that. And so when they say we want a good doctor, it's probably better that you get to a doctor sooner than you get to the top of the heap. But then if you wanted to look further than that, you have to have doctors that can create an efficiency level enough so that they can make money. It's not so much that they can make money to put into their own pocket, but they have to be able to make the system that they work in enough money so that the system can buy them the equipment that they need. You know, Watching Dr. Ionetti's slides and files was really fascinating. Every one of those little gadgets you saw flashing on the screen is about $500,000, okay? So that would be the next step. And then lastly, if you can cover all of those bases efficiently, you can get a chance to do something like what we're doing this morning, where you could actually do a little bit of research, a little bit of teaching, and that's, those are really the physicians that you're going to see that are starting to put their head above the rest of the pack. Now, when someone first tells you you have a, a neuroendocrine tumor or a cancer, you want to come in and you want to know, am I going to live, am I going to die, and what is my life going to be like, okay? Well, it is immensely more complex than that. But you need to have a doctor who can sit down and give you that answer, regardless of where your tumor is coming from, regardless of what its biologic activity is. And I would also say that I feel very fortunate to be in this, uh, in this group. I got another slide that I'll show you towards the end about the size of a, a puddle, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Is there something we can do to maybe make the rest of the slide come back into the the screen. We're kind of chopping it off. Well, if you look at the literature, at least four or five years ago, we went, uh, the average carcinoid tumor would go five or six years before it was diagnosed. 
And the question for that would be, well, why is that the case? Well, I would first say that you're probably not going to be able to diagnose a carcinoid tumor before it metastasizes. And that's because it's asymptomatic. It's going to start out as a little tiny thing on the outside of your intestine in most cases, and you have no way of knowing that it's there. Sure. Don't adjust your sets. No. Let me go and I'll tell you why we're waiting for that. I'm going to a joke my father used to tell me to tell whenever I had to go. I'd tell him I'm nervous about speaking. He'd say, well, tell him a joke about the guy who worked in the grocery store. It's a kind of a speaking joke. Now, when I was about 16, I worked in a grocery store. And one day a guy came in and said, I'd like half a head of lettuce. I said, what? He said, I want half a head of lettuce. So I said, well, just a minute. So I walked into the back of the store where the manager was, and I said, there's some idiot out there that wants half a head of lettuce. And I turned around, and he followed me into the back room. So I turned around to my boss, and I said, and this fine gentleman would like the other half. <laughs> so my boss stopped me later in the day and goes, what was that all about? And I said, uh, I kind of explained it to him. He goes, you know, I, I really like that ability to think quickly on your feet. He said, we're opening this store in uh, Philadelphia, and we'd like you to go there. And incidentally, that's where the Nanette's next meeting is going to be, in Philadelphia. Um, I said, I don't want to go to Philadelphia. The only people there are hockey players and hookers. He said, you know, my wife is from Philadelphia. I said, what team does she play for? There we go. Hey, don't worry so much about focusing in the fine print. It's kind of like that for to make a point. So first. I'm supposed to find the tumor. I guess I would be the gateway to the system, or the gastroenterologist is the gateway to the system, probably 70% of the time. Well, the complaint that they're going to come in with is chronic diarrhea. Now, if you ask most general physicians, they would say diarrhea is an easy thing to work up. Well, that would be acute diarrhea, and it's easy to work up because your body fixes it yourself. Most people who get a GI bug really have a preformed toxin that the bacteria made. The acid in the stomach kills the bacteria. The toxin escapes. It gives you symptoms for 12 to 24 hours. And then you get better all on your own without any help from the doctor. Well, if you get an infection and you come in, you get some antibiotics. Maybe it lasts two or three days. Most times you get better. When the patient comes in and says... I've had diarrhea for more than four weeks, or in some cases, years. You get into this differential diagnosis. There are an additional five pages that go in with this. This is from the uh, American Society of Family Practitioners. And to their credit, they do have neuroendocrine tumors on this list, but it's only one entry out of about 60. To get through that 
differential diagnosis and identify the cause of the chronic diarrhea is very difficult. I'd say even the best gastroenterologists are probably hitting that about 75% of the time. Also, that's probably complicated in a lot of cases. There's more than one entity on that list that's contributing to the symptoms. Most importantly, the medicines that you're taking. So the other quality you need in your doctor is somebody who is persistent. Now, this sort of takes me back. And if we have any baseball fans, this is the only pitcher that Mickey Mantle said I couldn't hit. And he's a long time ago, 56, was his rookie year, and he was rookie of the year. He got beamed with a line drive early in his second season and he never came back to, to where he was before that. Never really reached his potential. But he stayed in base, professional baseball for another six years, each year going further further down into the minor leagues until he got a job as a broadcast agent, and he still worked out the rest of his career in baseball. But I had when I read his story, I was... Um, at that time, I was just starting out in in uh, the Navy, and I was really impressed with his persistence. And I went to a presentation that Captain John Fellows gave, who was a POW of Vietnam. Now, Herb Score has a poem that I shared with my children by Winslow. When you get what you want and you struggle for self, the world makes you king for a day. Go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what the man has to say. It's great. I won't go through it all, but look it up. But he... That was his favorite. It was also Captain Fellow's favorite. And he told him that's what got him through six years in Hanoi. And so I picked it up, and it's just been that's been a great example for me of what you have to do to be persistent. It's what you have to do not only to get through that list and the differential diagnosis and find out what the cause of the diarrhea is, even in the patient that comes in who has a neurotic tumor, it's also what you have to do to treat them. You know, when they talk about serotonin in that first lecture, okay, well, serotonin is the major neurotransmitter from the emotional center of your brain. The reason that all of those IBS studies show this huge placebo effect is when those patients come in and take that medicine, they're expecting to feel better. The emotional center of their brain increases serotonin, and that generates their symptoms. Now, in the diarrhea that you're having, you have the opposite. You have too much serotonin, but you still have that change in that, that relationship between that neurotransmitter will generate a huge placebo effect. You've got to go out in any study in IBS at least two weeks so that you know that you're not dealing with the, that, that effect. And it's really a physiologic effect and now, when you go to see a gastroenterologist, there's really two kinds. There's a kind of gastroenterologist that does colonoscopies and EGDs for the most part. And we need doctors who do that. We don't have enough doctors to do. If we were to do all of the colon screening that we needed to do, we don't have the doctors to do that. Colon cancer is the number two cancer killer in America, and it should be nowhere near the top. It should be at the very, very bottom of the heap. However, if you go an extra year, you can do really, you learn to do two additional procedures. This procedure on the right is called an EUS or an endoscopic ultrasound. That's a little ultrasound transducer that looks out of the lumen that you're sitting in, and in this case at the head of the pancreas, and we can drive a needle into that and make a diagnosis. In addition to that, oops, let me come back. There's, there's a video that goes with this. But on the right, we also do something called ERCP. I won't even go into what that acronym means. But suffice it to say that we would put a catheter into your bile duct or into your pancreas to make sure that the plumbing in those ducts is working well. If you have a neuroendocrine tumor, you would like to have a therapeutic or a doctor who can do these two types of procedures. Uh, what I did is I've, I've been 
For some reason, Mobile, Alabama has a high percentage of neuroendocrine tumors. And what I did is I picked out a couple of patients to kind of show you what I do treatment-wise, because that's, I'm supposed to be talking about treatment. I picked out a few patients that I've had that have, I've sort of uh, kind of demonstrate what that therapy can be. Now this, this is a gentleman. He was took a trip to the Caribbean on a cruise with his wife and developed diarrhea there. That was the first signs of his carcinoid. And he went several years before he was diagnosed. That was sort of your standard carcinoid. And this is him in 2014 on the same chip. And we had done a number of procedures on him. Okay, and he passed away a year ago. Um, but when on him, what did I really do that, that helped change his life? Um, in addition to what all the other members of our team did. Well, he had been on depoactreotide, which is what you're going to be put on probably first, or sort of is, I guess, a standard to treat carcinoid syndrome. And I have a few things to say about that, too. The first is, especially if you're just newly diagnosed, whoever gives you that shot, they're, they're not all created equal. All right. There are some nurses that know how to give it, and it don't hurt. And there are others that it will hurt for a week for you, every time you sit down. Okay. So you need to sort of ask somebody in your area where the nurse is who can give a depoactreotide shot. Okay. Now, that should last for about four weeks, but as your tumor burden increases, you're going to overrun the capacity of that shot. When they say depo, what that means is they hook another molecule to that and they put it into the fat in your tissue, and it kind of seeps out slowly over a month, all right? Where if they just gave you the straight octreotide, you'd have it for a day or two. I don't know off the top of my head what the half-life is, but it wouldn't last near that long, and you don't want to be going and getting a shot every day. Okay, but there is another alternative to that, LSU is kind of in our area, and the guy at LSU is fond of doing this, uh, Gene Woltering. You can take an insulin pump and fill the insulin pump with octreotide and infuse that at a standard rate over a long period of time. That is an off-label indication for octreotide. So what does that mean? That means that the FDA has not said that it's okay. So... When we think about the doctor that we're choosing and the doctor-patient relationship that we're talking about, I don't really hesitate to use a drug on an off-label indication. However, I never use a drug on an off-label indication without a long discussion with the patient about what the pluses and minuses of doing that are. All right? You can overdose on octreotide. All right? So you have to be careful with that. However... If you're having 20 bowel movements a day, and that pump is going to make your life livable, especially if you're having incontinence with it. You know, I had one little old lady. I used to think incontinence was kind of a no harm, no foul type of diagnosis, because medically, it doesn't hurt you. Well, she came in, she said, I have incontinence. I said, okay. She said, no, I really have incontinence. I said, okay. I said, well, how has that affected you? She said, I haven't left my house in two years. I said, oh, okay, well, that's a problem, all right, especially for a woman. That pump, and that pump could alleviate that. Yeah, we could use that if we educate the patient into what the side effects of the drug are and to make sure that they know how they're using that. It's not that complicated. Also, I was involved in the study of uh, Telorostrat. That has worked fine. Now, that's going to come out in a 250 milligram a day dose. I had four patients, really, that I treated with that. One was a colleague's wife. I would pretty much go with the 500 milligram dose myself based upon those four patients, all right? That is not, that's really called anecdotal evidence or not as solid of science as you would like. 
That's just from standing in front of the patients listening to them talk about how their symptoms are and how their medications were. And I would say I wouldn't go in asking for a 500 milligram dose off the top, but I would ask your doctor about how he's going to choose to dose your medicine. Here's another sister drug that operates also on the same serotonin pathway that's been around a long time to treat diarrhea. There aren't that many good drugs out there that treat diarrhea. Okay, You have Lamotil, which has to have atropine in it. Atropine is a drug you give to somebody who's having a heart attack or having bradycardia. It is a fight or flight type of drug and it'll make your heart race, okay? That is not the drug you want patients taking day in and day out to handle diarrhea. Now, some can do that. It, the same, I guess, applies. You kind of watch and make sure they're not having that effect, but that's not one of my favorites to use uh, in terms of my own pref uh, preference. Then you have Imodium, which is not as effective, especially in something like carcinoid syndrome. Alocitron was really, really came out to treat IBS-type diarrhea, and I actually got very involved in it. When they already put it out, everybody used it. And a lot of times you'll get patients that have constipation and diarrhea that alternate. Well, it works so well that it's causing ischemic colitis, and they actually had a patient die from the use of Alocitron. A carcinoid patient does not have alternating constipation and diarrhea. For the most part, they have diarrhea every day, and they're not really a bad candidate for that. The same thing applies. You have to sit down and talk to them. You have to tell them, if you're getting constipated, stop taking the drug and call me. Okay? The other thing is, too, when I treat uh, patients with carcinoid or almost any neuroendocrine tumor, you know, the granules, so if you looked at these cells under a microscope, they got all these little beads in there. Those are granules that release the chemicals that give you the symptoms that you're having. One of those is chromogranin. The problem with chromogranin is there's a bunch of other drugs that make it go up. So if you're watching that level thinking, hey, you got to be careful because this is what's happening with my cancer, take it a little bit easy on that because it's not that accurate. Okay. There's a much more accurate one, which is pancreastatin, but it's also much more expensive to use. So what I usually do, the number one medicine that runs up your chromogranin are antacid medicines, like Nexium or Pilosec or those. So if you're using those, stop that five days before you go to see your doctor, and you'll get a little more accurate level if he draws the level. But if you can't stop that or you're having trouble, well, you can use the other one, and that'll give you a little bit more accurate measurement of what the activity of the tumor is. In addition to that, and this goes really for all cancers, we treat nausea. And, man, I'm telling you, you would that's another one that you would not on the surface think, well, how bad is that? You know, it wipes them out if it gets severe enough. And the gentleman that we're talking about, that was his main complaint the last two years. And I have a couple of notes on medicines that we use for that. In terms of Reglan, like if you watch TV, you'll see that Reglan will come out and they'll say, you know, the lawyers have gotten a hold of it. Well, that's the only pro-motility agent we have for the stomach, really. The only FDA-approved pro-motility agent. Okay, so if you're having nausea, especially if you're having delayed gastric emptying with the nausea, that's about your only game in town. So you're going to say, so you say to yourself, well, why is it on all of these lawsuits? Well, it's on this lawsuits because it causes a tremor, one of the tremors that it causes is in your lower jaw, and it can be very disfiguring. But a, only a very small percentage of people get that tremor in their lower jaw and it doesn't go away. I have a partner, I don't do this, but I have a partner who used to give it in an IV drip in the hospital for patients who came in with gastroparesis because he was helping out the doctors who were doing all the bariatric surgery in the hospital. I never, I saw two cases of tardive dyskinesia and both stopped with that. Of the hundreds that he treated that I would have to follow on the weekends when I was on call. Another drug, which is a good drug, 
for gastroparesis, especially in the short term, or bad nausea and vomiting is erythromycin. But you got to be careful with that because it interacts with a lot of other medicines. These two interact with each other. And lastly, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, in terms of this case, just stop. I got enough to go for a while. So if I start running over, just let me know. Okay. All right. Your intestines, for the most part, hang in small membranes, little drapes and they can kind of slide back and forth on each other to accommodate what you eat. Well, you get those intestines to stick together because you got a tumor in there. Instead of sliding, they buckle, and it's like a pipe. When you bend the pipe, it closes, okay? Well, that obstructs you, and that causes nausea and vomiting. They also tend to wrap, the tumor wraps those membranes around each other, and it's like putting it on a reel where it kind of clamps it down. That was his problem. Can we run this video? This is one of the things that we do where we can put a stent inside that stricture. We're back to adjusting our sets. Right. Well, as I'm running short already, I will move on. Okay, this next patient I have, he had a non-functioning pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. And he got a bunch of stuff done. He also was with us for nine years. That's all that he had done. A distal pancreatectomy, a wedge resection of the right lobe of the liver, radiofrequency ablation, multiple surgeries, CERT, and then sandostatin therapy. This is a, an ERCP video. This is probably not going to play either. So I will. There we go. Okay, so here's the scope going down into the stomach, through the stomach, into the small intestine. That's your bile duct, goes up into your liver. That's your pancreatic duct. So in the ERCP, here we are putting the cannula in, and we're going to put a wire up into that duct. There's the tumor, okay? And this is just a. This cartoon is from the maker of this particular stent. There's probably half a dozen out there that do it. It just kind of showed the things that I wanted to talk about the most. And the patient we're talking about, the right lobe is gone. This tube comes up and branches. The right lobe is gone, but right where it branched was strictured because they had taken away some of the vasculature on the uh, um, duct and the duct scarred down. So we were basically doing this to his bile ducts to keep them open. So we slide in another stent. The stent is really just a little nitinol, which is kind of a very fine, flexible metal. It looks kind of like chicken wire, and they pack it all into a, it's a cylinder shape, but they pack it all inside this little plastic tube, and they pull the tube off, and it expands out and opens up. So now, you lose your great suntan or your jaundice, because we can open up the bile duct, and all that can flow out. So that's an ERCP, but in this case... He had a bad stricture that took multiple stenting and a lot, was a lot of work. And he also had stones above the stent and the stricture. In addition to that, probably one of the best things we can do, especially, I'll tell you another patient. My nurse had a uh, husband had a neuroendocrine tumor in his pancreas, another non-function. And she called me one night and said, I'm having a lot of trouble with my husband. I said, well, what kind of trouble are you having? And she said, well... You know, he used to ride the rodeo. I watched him one time get on the horse. He got thrown. It almost tore off his finger. He said he put, packed his hand back into the glove, got on, because he knew he could win the rodeo if he rode the last row and get win the trailer that he was trying to win. So, needless to say, he was a pretty tough guy, right? Well, when I came over to the house to see him, he was rolled up in a ball, rocking back and forth on his back because the pain in his pancreas was so severe. Now, not everybody who has an orange tumor or a tumor in the pancreas gets that pain. Your pancreas makes enzymes that digest your food, and if they can't get out of the pancreas, they digest the pancreas, and then they digest you, which is a severe chemical burn, okay? Now, understand, too, if you're a carcinoid tumor or something like that, you don't have to worry about this. This is for tumors in the pancreas. But what this procedure is showing, can we run the film? What I can do to relieve that pain is put 
alcohol or phenol into the nerve. This is the aorta, big vessel goes down your back, and that's the celiac axis coming off there. You have three major vessels that go to your stomach. These little black dots in this area, that's the center of all of the nerves that go to your pancreas. Yeah, please. Success. There's the needle coming out of the scope, and it's going to come down into here. So we're sort of confirm where we are. It does a great job, but you have to get in there sooner. Once the pain gets established, especially if it's severe pain, it's much, much harder to treat. And you can see when the color comes out, you can see that's medicine coming out of the end of the needle. There we go. Okay. This is from a pancreatic leak, where I said that the pancreas will digest itself, and if it gets out, it digests you. Well, it will create pockets of dead tissue that liquefy, and they can get infected. We can actually go in. This is a stent between the stomach and the cyst. The pancreas sits right underneath the stomach. So where it makes that fluid collection is right up against the stomach. I just did one of these Friday, by the way. Anyways, you can uh, you put a stent into that, and you can go in, drain the fluid out, and treat that pseudocyst without surgery, all right? You get into that complication, unless you're with a surgeon or a gastroenterologist that really knows what they're doing, you could get into a lot of trouble. I go into that a little further, but we're running a little bit short of time. This last part is really actually important. This is us rowing at the NCAA championships a long time ago. Anyways, it's probably the best example of teamwork I saw. If you could see it, you really can't. Those oars are hitting the water at exactly the same time. My dad did a great job when he took that picture. Anyways, the question that I you have to ask yourself when you're considering what doctor you're talking to is what is the network that he's tied into? Because I'm only as good as the interventional radiologist, the pancreatic surgeon, the oncologist, the pulmonologist, and the thoracic surgeon that are with me. This is what we have in Mobile, and it's set up really nice. We have a patient support group as well, and a bunch of other things. We do training from time to time with everybody there, but we know what the referral network is. I can't tell you the number of times I've gone into a patient's room or talked to a patient and they'll say, will you please talk to the other doctors because you guys are not telling me the same story, okay? And how difficult that can be to really get everybody on the same team going the same direction. Um, make sure that you have that and make sure that you have a, a crew of people around or whoever, wherever you're being treated that can do all of those things. I could call any of these guys or ladies at any time and ask him a question. I asked, called one this morning about an MRI question, and he got on the phone on Saturday morning and gave me the answer. The other issue is when you're talking about the treatment team, most importantly, you're on that team as a patient. Okay, so what does that mean? You know, I'll give you another short story here. I was not a doctor in my first career. So gross anatomy, my first year of medical school, first thing I do is a hand in the arm. And they went into just excruciating detail on every, you'd never know what's inside them. So we get up to about the second week, and he starts off, and he puts the title of the lecture up, says, this is a shoulder. I said, hey, you're going to have to stop for a second. I just want to enjoy the simplicity of what life used to be before you complicate me a lot of it, okay? Well, you're locked into that same problem because somebody comes to you and says, you have a neuroendocrine tumor. Well, what in the world is that, and what do I have to do about it? The, the answer to that question is important, and it's really important that you know it so that when you sit down, you're the one who's going to be paying the bill whether it's most importantly with your health, but also financially, you have a voice in what happens to you. And the only way that you're going to do that is to learn about neuroendocrine tumors, and it's not a simple feel. That's why what they're doing here today is really important. Get with some people so that you know what's going on 
understand whenever somebody comes out to you and says, well, we could do this. Well, yeah, but what are the risks and what, the, what, are, what are the benefits? The overwhelming chances are you're not going to be cleared of your tumor if it's diagnosed after it's metastatic, okay? So nobody can really fix you, all right? So you're always looking. You're not deciding, are you going to fix my cancer or not fix my cancer, which is what you would want to if you thought about it in simple terms. What you're really thinking about is, what is the benefit going to be to me if it works? What is the likelihood that what you're going to do is going to work? And what is the risk and the likelihood that I'm going to accept that risk? And you want a big gap between the benefit and the risk, all right? If there's not a big gap there in America, in medicine today, you probably shouldn't be doing it. That's all I got.